Hello dear viewers, it's March 16th and today we're going to talk about time frames. Do you remember yesterday I said that this morning we would discuss why I was, to a certain extent, sure that everything should have gone much faster than it actually does? The thing is that even before the war started, beginning from the spring 2014, I was actively involved in the anti-fascist movement in Ukraine. Naturally, we still communicate with each other, keep in touch. Back in 2014, we made a lot of acquaintances and friends. These became my brothers-in-arms, by the way, including my comrade Mikhail Anufrienka, whom I also met in the spring of 2014. Since then, we have always been together, and today many of them make up the very civil military administrations in Kharkiv, Dnepropetrovsk, Zaporozhye. These are the people I have known since 2014. So, even before the war started, communicating with each other, speculating on how certain events might develop, uh, I can tell you today, because no one is interested in it today, because this plan has been discarded and no one will ever go back to it. So, before the war started, there were agreements with representatives of different elites from different cities in the south and east of Ukraine, and they promised to surrender their cities in the event of D-Day. So, the whole development of military activities near Kharkiv on the first day of the war, February the 24th, indicated that the Russian army, having believed the Ukrainian elites, these local Ukrainian elites, or in this case the elites of Kharkiv, carried out this plan. And the plan to quickly cut off the city from the rest of Ukraine, to isolate the city from the rest of Ukraine, so that the local government could proclaim a new Ukrainian government. But they stabbed the Russians in the back. The elites supported the incumbent regime. This is the reason why Russian troops suffered heavy losses near Kharkiv during the first days of the war. And this is the reason, among others of course, why civil military administrations were not created in the first days of the war. I assumed that in some parts of Ukraine it would not be necessary. It really was a big political miscalculation. Once again, the Russian authorities trusted in the Ukrainians, those so-called pro-Russian Ukrainian elites. I have been saying about it since 2015, do not trust any of the so-called pro-Russian Ukrainian authorities. All of them are not just fed from the same sources, they are all created by the same system. And they are simply parasitic on the territory of Ukraine, hiding behind different ideas and flags in order to rob the people of Ukraine altogether. Nobody has paid attention to an interesting pattern. Here, literally, till February the 24th, in all Ukrainian political talk shows, so-called patriots kept saying that there was a problem of oligarchs in Ukraine. What was the problem? They all were reported to be pro-Russians. I want to ask you a question today. Are you still pouring banana oil in the ears of the local population? And indeed, pay attention, all of the Ukrainian oligarchs, without exception, have gathered around the current regime. And it was quite logical, because all those so-called oligarchs in Ukraine were to disappear once and for all as a result of this war. Anyway, it's all in the past now. This page has been turned and we are writing another one. Those so-called pro-Russian authorities of Ukraine, who now unanimously support Zelensky as the one and only president who must of course win, at least in their opinion. You know, in a way I am grateful to them, because these actions allow us to terminate any agreement with them. And that's it. Now those agreements can no longer exist. And this allows us, when we win, uh, which is inevitable anyway, to build a new Ukraine without them. Without the representatives of these so-called elites. That is why they call themselves the elite, having made their choice, thereby giving us freedom in action. Now, when it's all discarded, the new future Ukraine is waiting not only denazification, but also deoligarchization and nationalization. And, you know, we have a unique chance to build a country where we can build a new kind of society. It is going to be hard and difficult, of course. Yes, after the war, after the destruction, it will be very, very difficult. But in this situation, despite the fact that in the early days it brought certain problems, uh, this situation gives us a unique chance for the future development.
And I will do my best to make sure that we, the representatives of the new Ukrainian government, use this chance for the good of our people. So that's all what I wanted to tell you in this video. Bye.